got 35. We did what about the shadow of wool. Americans in the 1930s tried to turn their backs on the world's problems. Their president at first seemed to share these views. The only battle Roosevelt sought was against the Depression. America had its own burdens to shoulder, and the cost of foreign involvement, whether in blood or treasure, simply seemed too great. But as the clouds of war gathered over Europe, Roosevelt eventually concluded that the United States could no longer remain aloof. Events gradually brought the American people around his thinking. No nation was safe in an era of international anarchy, and the world could not remain half enchained and half free. The London Conference the 66-nation London Economic Conference meeting in the summer of 1933 revealed how thoroughly Roosevelt's early foreign policy was subordinated by his strategy for domestic economic recovery. The delegates to the London Conference hoped to organize a coordinated international attack on the global depression. They were particularly eager to stabilize the values of the various nations' currencies and the, and the rates at which they could be exchanged. Exchange rate stabilization was essential to the revival of world trade, which had all but evaporated by 1933. Roosevelt at first agreed to send an American delegation to the conference, including Secretary of State Cordell Hull. But the president soon began to have second thoughts about the conference's agenda. He wanted to pursue his gold juggling and other inflationary policies at home as the means of stimulating the American economy and American recovery. An international agreement to maintain the value of the dollar in terms of other currencies might tie his hands, and at the bottom, Roosevelt was unwilling to sacrifice the possibility of domestic recovery for the sake of international cooperation. While vacationing on his yacht along the New England coast, he dashed off a radio message to London, scolding the conference for attempting to stabilize currencies and essentially declaring America's withdrawal from the negotiations. Roosevelt's bombshell announcement yanked the rug from under London, the London conference. The delegates adjourned, empty-handed, amid cries of American bad faith. Whether the conference could have arrested the worldwide economic slide is debatable, but Roosevelt's every-man-for-himself attitude plunged the planet deeper into economic crisis. The collapse of the London conference also strengthened the global trend towards extreme nationalism making international cooperation ever more difficult as the dangerous decade of the 1930s unfolded. Reflecting the powerful persistence of American isolationism, Roosevelt action, Roosevelt's action played directly into the hands of the power-mad dictators who were determined to shatter the peace of the world. Americans themselves would eventually pay a high price for the narrow-minded belief that the United States could go it alone in the modern world. Freedom for, from, the Filipinos, and recognition for the Russians. Roosevelt matched isolationism from Europe with withdrawal from Asia. The Great Depression burst the fragile bubble of President McKinley's imperialistic dream in the Far East. With the descent into hard times, American taxpayers were eager to throw overboard their expensive tropical liability in the Philippine Islands. Organized labor demanded the exclusion of low-wage Filipino workers, and American sugar producers clamored for the elimination of the Philippi of Philippine competition. Remembering its earlier promises for freedom for the Philippines, <clears throat> Congress passed the Tidings McDuffie Act in 1934. The act provided for the independence of the Philippines after a 12-year period of economic and political tutelage, that is, by 1946. The United States agreed to relinquish its army bases, but naval bases were reserved for future discussion and retention. In truth, the American people were not so much giving freedom to the Philippines as they were freeing themselves from the Philippines. With a selfish eye to their own welfare, and the apparent disregard for the political situation in Asia, they proposed to leave the Philippines to their fate, while imposing upon the Filipinos economic terms so ungenerous as to threaten the islands with economic prostration. Once again, American isolationists rejoiced. Yet in Tokyo, Japanese militarists were calculating that they had little to fear from an inward-looking America that was abandoning its principal possession in Asia. <clears throat> At the same time, Roosevelt made at least one internationalist gesture when he finally recognized the Soviet Union in 1933. Over the noisy protests of anti-communist conservative as well as Roman Catholics offended by the Kremlin's anti-religious policies, Roosevelt extended the hand of diplomatic recognition to the 16-year-old Bolshevik regime. He was motivated in part 
by the hope for trade with the Soviet Russians, as well as the desire to bolster the Soviet Union as a friendly counterweight to the possible threat of German power in Europe and Japanese power in Asia. Becoming a Good Neighbor Closer to home, Roosevelt inaugurated a refreshing new era in relations with Latin America. He proclaimed in his inaugural address, I would de dedicate this nation to the policy of the good neighbor. Taken together, Roosevelt's non-involvement in Europe and withdrawal from Asia, along with this brotherly embrace of his new world neighbors, suggested that the United States was giving up its ambition to be a world power and would content itself instead with being merely a regional power, its interests and activities confined exclusively to the Western Hemisphere. <clears throat> Old-fashioned intervention by bayonet in the Caribbean had not paid off except in an evil harvest of resentment, suspicion, and fear. The Great Depression had cooled off Yankee economic aggressiveness as thousands of investors in Latin America, Latin American securities, became sack holders rather than stockholders. There were now fewer dollars to be protected by the rifles of the hated Marines. With war-thirsty dictators seizing power in Europe and Asia, Roosevelt was eager to line up the Latin Americans to help defend the Western Hemisphere. Embittered neighbors would be potential tools of transoceanic aggressors. President Roosevelt made clear at the onset that he was going to renounce armed intervention, particularly the vexatious corollary of the Monroe Doctrine, devised by his cousin Theodore Roosevelt. Late in 1933, at the 7th Pan American Conference in Montevideo, Uruguay, the U.S. delegation formally endorsed non intervention. Deeds followed words. The last Marines departed from Haiti in 1934. In the same year, rest of Cuba was released from the hobbles of the Platt Amendment, under which the United States had been free to intervene, although the naval base at Guantanamo was retained. The tiny country of Panama received a similar uplift in 1936, when Washington relaxed its grip on the Isthmus nation. The <clears throat> hope-inspiring good neighbor policy, with the accent on con consultation and non-intervention, received its acid test in Mexico. When the Mexican government seized Yankee oil properties in 1938, American investors vehemently demanded armed intervention to repossess their confiscated businesses. But Roosevelt successfully resisted the bad badgering, and a settlement was finally threshed out in 1941, even though the oil companies lost much of their original stake. Spectacular successes crowned Roosevelt's good neighbor policies. His earnest attempts to usher in a new era of friendliness, though hurting some U.S. bondholders, paid rich dividends in goodwill among the peoples to the South. No other citizen of the United States has ever been held in such high esteem in Latin America during his lifetime. Roosevelt was cheered with tumultuous enthusiasm when, as a traveling salesman for peace, he journeyed to the special inter-American conference in Buenos Aires, Argentina, in 1936. The Colossus of the North <clears throat> now seemed less like a vulture and more like an eagle. Super theory all. Reciprocal Trade Agreements Intimately associated with the good neighborism, and also popular in Latin America, was the reciprocal trade policy of the New Dealers. Its chief architect was the idealistic Secretary of State Hull, a high-minded Tennessean of the low-tariff school. Like Roosevelt, he believed that trade was a two-way street. The nation can sell abroad only if it buys abroad, that tariff barriers choke off foreign trade, <clears throat> and that trade was wars beget shooting wars. Mm -hmm. Responding to the whole Roosevelt leadership, Congress passed the Reciprocal Trade Agreement Act in 1934, designed in part to lift American export trade from the Depression doldrums. This enlightened measure was aimed at both relief and recovery. At the same time, <clears throat> it activated the low tariff policies of the New Dealers. The Reciprocal Trade Agreement Act avoided the dangerous uncertainties of a wholesale tariff revision. It merely whittled down the most objectionable schedules of the Holly Smoot Law by amending them. Roosevelt was empowered to lower existing rates by as much as 50%, provided that the other country involved was willing to respond with similar reductions. The resulting pacts, moreover, were to become effective without the formal approval of the Senate novel feature not only ensured speedier action, but sidestepped the twin evils of high-stakes log-rolling and high-pressure lobbying in Congress. Secretary Hull, whose zeal for reciprocity was unflagging, succeeded in negotiating pacts with 21 countries by the end of 1939. During these same years, 
U.S. foreign trade increased appreciably, presuming in part as a result of the Hull-Roosevelt policies. Trade agreements undoubtedly bettered economic and political relations with Latin America and proved to be an influence for peace in a war-bent world. The Reciprocal Trade Agreements Act was a landmark piece of legislation. It reversed the traditional high protective tariff policy that had persisted, almost unbroken since the Civil War days, that had so damaged the American and international economies following World War I. It paved the way for the American-led free trade international economic system that took shape after World War II, a period that witnessed the most robust growth in the history of international trade. Impulses towards storm cellar isolationism. Post-1918 chaos in Europe, followed by the Great Depression, spawned the ominous spread of totalitarianism. The individual was nothing. The state was everything. The communist USSR led the way with the crafty and ruthless Joseph Stalin, finally emerging as dictator. Blustery Benito Mussolini, a swaggering fascist, seized the reins of power in Italy during 1922 and Adolf Hitler, a fanatic with a toothbrush mustache, plotted and harangued his way into control of Germany in 1933 with liberal use of the big lie. Hitler was the most dangerous of the dictators because he combined tremendous power with impulsiveness. A frustrated Austrian painter with hypnotic talents as an orator and a leader had <clears throat> secured control of the Nazi party by making political capital of the Treaty of Versailles, and Germany's depression spawned unemployment. He was thus a misbegotten child of the short-sighted post-war policies of the victorious allies, including the United States. The desperate German people had fallen in behind the new Pied Piper, for they saw no other hope of escaping from the plague of economic chaos and national disgrace. In 1936, the Nazi Hitler and the fascist Mussolini allied themselves in the Rome-Berlin Axis. International gangsterism was likewise spreading in the Far East, where the imperial Japan was on the way on the make. Like Germany and Italy, Japan was so-called the have-not power. Like them, it resented the ungenerous Treaty of Versailles. Like them, it demanded additional space for its teeming millions, cooped up by their crowded island nation. Japanese navalists were not to be denied. Determined to find a place in the Asiatic sun, Tokyo gave notice in 1934 of the termination of the 12-year-old Washington Naval Treaty. A year later, at London, the Japanese torpedoed all effective hopes of naval <coughs> uh, disarm disarmament. Upon being denied complete parity, they walked out on the multi-power conference and accelerated their construction of giant battleships. Jut-jawed Mussolini, seeking both glory and empire in Africa, brutally attacked Ethiopia in 1935 with bombers and tanks. The brave defenders, armed with spears and ancient firearms, were speedily crushed. Members of the League of Nations could have caused Mussolini's war machine to creak to a halt if they had only dared to embargo oil. But when the League quailed rather than risk global hostilities, it merely signed its own death warrant. Isolationism, long festering in America, received a strong boost from these alarms abroad. Though disapproving of the dictators, Americans still believed that their encircling seas conferred a kind of mystic immunity. They were continuing to suffer the disillusionment born of their participation in World War I, which they now regarded as a colossal blunder. <clears throat> they likewise nursed bitter memories of the ungrateful and defaulting debtors. As early as 1934, a spiteful Congress passed the Johnson Debt Default Act, which prevented debt-dodging nations from borrowing further in the United States. If attacked again by aggressors, these delinquents could, quote, stew in their own juices. Mired down in the Great Depression, Americans had no real appreciation of the revolutionary forces being harnessed by the dictators. The have-not powers were out to become the have-powers. Americans were not much afraid that totalitarian aggression would cause trouble, as they were fearful that they might be drawn into it. Strong nationwide sentiment welled up for a constitutional amendment to forbid a declaration of war by Congress, except in the case of an invasion, unless there was a favorable popular referendum. With a mixture of seriousness and frivolity, a group of Princeton University students began to agitate in 1936 for a bonus to be paid to the veterans of future wars, while the prospective frontliners were still alive. Congress legislates neutrality. <clears throat> 
As the gloomy 1930s lengthened, an avalanche of lurid articles and books condemning the munitions manufacturers as war-fomenting merchants of death poured from the American presses. A Senate commission <coughs> committee, headed by General N Senator Gerald Nye of North Dakota, was appointed in 1934 to investigate the blood business. By sensationalizing evidence regarding America's entry into World War I, the senatorial probers tended to shift the blame away from the German submarines onto the German bankers and arms manufacturers. Because the munitions makers had obviously made money out of the war, many a naive citizen leapt to the illogical conclusion that these soulless scavengers had caused the war in order to make money. This kind of reasoning suggested that if the profits could only be removed from the arms traffic, one hell of a business, the country could steer clear of any world conflict that might erupt in the future. Responding to overwhelming popular pressure, Congress made haste to legislate the nation out of war. Action was spurned by the danger that Mussolini's Ethiopia assault would plunge the world into a new bloodbath. The Neutrality Acts of 1935, 1936, and 1937, taken together, stipulated that when the president proclaimed the existence of a foreign war, certain restrictions would automatically go into effect. One, no American could legally sail on a belligerent ship, sell or transport munitions to a belligerent, or make loans to a belligerent. <clears throat> this head-in-the-sand legislation, in effect, marked an abandonment of the traditional policy of freedom of the seas, a policy for which the Americans had professionally, professedly fought two full-fledged wars and several undeclared wars. The neutrality acts were specifically tailored to keep the nation out of a conflict like World War I. If they had been in effect at that time, America probably would not have been <clears throat> sucked in, at least not in April 1917. Congress was one war too late with its legislation. What had seemed dishonorable to Wilson seemed honorable and desirable to a later disillusioned generation. Storm cellar neutrality proved to be tragically short-sighted. America falsely assumed that the decision for peace or war lay in its own hands, not in those of the satanic forces already unleashed in the world. Prisoner of its own fears, it failed to recognize that it might have used its enormous power to shape international events. Instead, it remained at the mercy of events controlled by the dictators. Statutory neutrality, though of undoubted legal illegality, <clears throat> was of dubious morality. America served notice that it would make no distinction whatever between brutal aggressors and innocent victims. By striving to hold the scales even, it actually overbalanced them in, overbalanced them in favor of the dictators, who had armed themselves to the teeth by declining to use its vast industrial strength to aid its democratic friends and defeat its totalitarian foes, it helped goad the aggressors along their blood-spattered path of conquest. <clears throat> America dooms loyalists to Spain. The Spanish Civil War of 1936 and 1939, a proving round of dress rehearsal in a miniature for World War II, was a painful object lesson in the folly of neutrality by legislation. Spanish rebels, who rose against the left-leaning Republican government in Madrid, were headed by a fascist General Francisco Franco. Generously aided by his fellow conspirators Hitler and Mussolini, he undertook to overthrow the established Loyalist regime, which in turn was assisted on a smaller scale by the Soviet Union. This pipeline from Communist Moscow chilled the natural sympathies of many Americans, especially Roman Catholics. <clears throat> Washington continued official relations with the Loyalist government. In accordance with previous American practice, this regime should have been free to purchase desperately needed munitions from the United States, but Congress, with the encouragement of Roosevelt and with only one dissenting vote, amended the existing neutrality legislation so that as to apply an arms embargo to both Loyalist and rebels. Roosevelt, remarked Dictator Franco, behaved in the manner of a true gentleman. FDR later regretted being so gentlemanly. Uncle Sam thus sat on the sidelines while Franco, abundantly supplied with arms and men by his fellow dictators, strangled the Republican government of Spain. The democracies, including the United States, were so determined to stay out of war that they helped to condemn a fellow democracy to death. In doing so, in so doing, they further encouraged the dictators to take the dangerous road that led over the precipice to World War II. Such peace at any priceism was further cursed with illogic.
Although determined to stay out of the war, America declined to build up its armed forces to a point where it could deter the aggressors. In fact, it allowed its navy to decline in relative strength. It had been led to believe that huge fleets caused huge wars. It was also trying to spare the complaining taxpayer during the grim days of the Great Depression. When President Roosevelt repeatedly called for preparedness, he was branded a warmonger. Not until 1938, the year before World War II exploded, did Congress come to grips with a problem when it passed a billion-dollar Naval Construction Act. The calamitous story was repeated of too little, too late. <clears throat> Appeasing Germany and Japan. Sulfurous war clouds had meanwhile been gathering in the tension-taught Far East. <clears throat> in 1937, the Japanese militarists at the Marco Polo Bridge near Peking <clears throat> touched off the explosion that led to an all-out invasion of China. In a sense, this attack was the curtain raiser of World War II. Roosevelt shrewdly declined to invoke the recently passed neutrality legislation by refusing to call the China incident an officially declared war. If he had put the existing restrictions into effect, he would have cut off the trickle of munitions on which the Chinese were desperately dependent. The Japanese, of course, could continue to buy mountains of war supplies in the United States. In Chicago, unofficial isolationist capital of America, President Roosevelt delivered his sensational quarantine speech. In the autumn of 1937, alarmed by the recent aggressors of Italy and Japan, he called for, quote, positive endeavors <clears throat> to quarantine the aggressors, presumably by economic embargoes. The speech triggered a cyclone of protest from isolationists and other foes of involvement. They feared that a moral quarantine would lead to a shooting quarantine. Startled by this anger response, Roosevelt retreated and sought less direct means to curb dictators. America's isolationist mood intensified, especially in regard to China. In December 1937, J Japanese aviators bombed and sank an American gunboat, the Panay, in Chinese waters, with a loss of two killed and 30 wounded. In the days of 1898, when the Maine went down, this outrage might have provoked a war. But after Tokyo hastened to make the necessary apologies and pay a proper indemnity, Americans breathed a deep sigh of relief. Japanese militarists were thus encouraged to vent their anger against the superior white race by rejecting American civil civilians in China, both male and female, to humiliating slappings and strippings. <clears throat> Adolf Hitler, meanwhile, grew louder and bolder in Europe. In 1935, he had openly flouted the Treaty of Versailles by introducing compulsory military service in Germany. The next year, he brazenly marched into the demilitarized German Rhineland, likewise contrary to the detested treaty, while France and Britain looked on in agony of indecision. Lashing his followers, no, lashing his following to a frenzy, Hitler undertook to persecute and then exterminate the Jewish population in the areas under his control. In the end, he wiped out about six million innocent victims, <clears throat> mostly in gas chambers. Calling upon his people to sacrifice butter for guns, he whipped the new German Air Force and mechanized ground divisions into the most devastating military machine the world had ever seen. <clears throat> Suddenly, in March 1938, Hitler bloodlessly occupied German-speaking Austria, his birthplace. The democratic powers, wringing their hands in despair, prayed that this last grab would satisfy passion for conquest. But, like a drunken reveler calling for a madder music and stronger wine, Hitler could not stop. Intoxicated by his recent gains, he began to make bullying demands for the German-inhabited Sudan land of neighboring Czechoslovakia. The leaders of Britain and France, eager to appease Hitler, sought frantically to bring the dispute to the conference table. President Roosevelt, <clears throat> also deeply alarmed, kept the wires hot with personal messages to both Hitler and Mussolini, urging a peaceful settlement. A conference was finally held in Munich, Germany, in September 1938. The Western European democracies, badly unprepared for war, betrayed Czechoslovakia to Germany when they consented to the shearing away of the Sudetenland. <clears throat> they hoped, and these hopes were, not, were shared by the American people, that the concessions at the conference table would slake Hitler's thirst for power and bring peace in our time. Indeed, Hitler publicly promised that the Sudetenland is the last territorial claim I have to make in Europe. Appeasement of the dictators, symbolized by the ugly word Munich, 
turned out to be merely surrender on the installment plan. It was like giving a cannibal a finger in the hope of saving an arm. In March 1939, <clears throat> scarcely six months later, Hitler suddenly erased the rest of Czechoslovakia from the map. Contrary to his solemn vows, the democratic world was again stunned. <clears throat> I love you too, buddy. Hitler's belligerency and U.S. neutrality. <clears throat> Joseph Stalin, the Sphinx of the Kremlin, was a key to the peace puzzle. In the summer of 1939, the British and French were busily negotiating with Moscow, hoping of securing a mutual defense treaty that would halt Hitler. But mutual suspicions proved insuperable. <clears throat> then the Soviet Union astounded the world by signing, on August 23, 1939, a non-aggression treaty with the German dictator. The notorious Hitler-Stalin pact meant that the Nazi German leader now had a green light to make war on Poland and the Western democracies without fearing a stab in the back from the Soviet Union, his communist arch-foe. Consternation struck those wishful thinkers in Western Europe who had fondly hoped that Hitler might be egged upon <clears throat> who might be egged upon Stalin so that the twin menaces would bleed each other to death. It was as plain as the mustache on Stalin's face that the widely Soviet dictator was plotting to turn his German accomplice against Western democracies. The two warring camps would then kill each other off and leave Stalin bestriding Europe like a colossus. With the signing of the Nazi-Soviet pact, World War II was only hours away. Hitler now demanded from neighboring Poland a return of the areas wrested from Germany after World War I. Failing to secure satisfaction, <clears throat> he sent his mechanized divisions crashing into Poland at dawn on September 1st, 1939. <clears throat> Britain and France, honoring their commitments to Poland, promptly declared war. At long last, they perceived the folly of continued appeasement. But they were powerless to aid Poland, which succumbed in three weeks to Hitler's smashing strategy of terror. Stalin, as prearranged, secretly in his fateful pact with Hitler, came in on the kill for his share of old Russian Poland. Long-dreaded World War II was now fully launched, and the long truce of 1919 and 1939 had come to an end. President Roosevelt speedily issued the routine proclamations of neutrality. Americans were overwhelmingly anti-Nazi and anti-Hitler. <clears throat> they fervently hoped that the democracies would win. They finally believed that the forces of righteousness would triumph, as in 1918. But they were desperately determined to stay out. They were not going to be suckers again. No Neutrality promptly became a heated issue in the United States. Ill-prepared Britain and France urgently needed American airplanes and other weapons, but the Neutrality Act of 1937 raised a sternly forbidding hand. Roosevelt summoned Congress in special session, shortly after the invasion of Poland, to consider lifting the arms embargo. After six hectic weeks of debate, a makeshift law emerged. The Neutrality Act of 1939 provided that henceforth the European democracies might buy American war materials, but only on a cash-and-carry basis. This meant that they would have to transport the munitions in their own ships after paying for them in cash. American, America would thus avoid loans, war debts, and the torpedoing of American arms carriers. While Congress thus loosened former restrictions in response to interventionist cries, it added others in response to isolationist fears. Roosevelt <clears throat> was now also authorized to proclaim danger zones into which American merchant ships would be forbidden to enter. Despite its defects, this unneutral neutrality law clearly favored the democracies against the dictators, and was so intended. As the British and French navies controlled the Atlantic, the European aggressors could not send their ships to buy American munitions. The United States not only improved its moral position, but simultaneously helped its economic position. Overseas demand for war goods brought a sharp upswing from the re recession of 1937 and 1938, and ultimately saw the decade-long unemployment crisis. The Fall of France <coughs> The Fall of France The months following the collapse of Poland while France and Britain marked time, were known as the Phony War. An ominous silence fell on Europe as Hitler shifted his victorious divisions from Poland for a knock-up low at France. 
Inaction during this anxious period was relieved by the Soviets, who wantonly attacked neighboring Finland in an effort to secure strategic buffer territory. The debt-paying Finns, who had lost a host of admirers in America, were speedily granted $30 million by an isolationist Congress for non-military supplies. But despite heroic resistance, Finland was finally flattened by the Soviet steamroller. An abrupt end to the phony war came in April 1940, when Hitler, again without warning, overran his weaker neighbors, Denmark and Norway. Hardly pausing for breath, the next month he attacked the Netherlands and Belgium, followed by a paralyzing blow at France. By late June, France was forced to surrender, but not until Mussolini had pounced on its rear for a jackal's share of the loot. In a pell-mell but successful evacuation from the French port of Dunkirk, the British managed to salvage the bulk of their shattered and partially disarmed army. The crisis providentially brought forth an inspired leader in Prime Minister Winston Churchill, the bulldog jog orator who nerved his people to fight off the fearful air bombings of their cities. France's sudden collapse shocked Americans out of their daydreams. Stout-hearted Britons singing, There Will Always Be in England, were all there all that stood between Hitler and the death of constitutional government in Europe. If Britain went under, Hitler would have at his disposal the workshops, shipyards, and slave labor of Western Europe. He might even have the powerful British fleet as well. This frightening possibility, which seemed to pose a dire threat to American security, steeled the American people to a tremendous effort. Roosevelt moved with electrifying energy and dispatch. He called upon an already debt-burdened nation to build huge air fleets and a two-ocean navy, which could also check Japan. Congress, jarred out of its apathy towards preparedness, with a year appropriated within the year, appropriated the astounding sum of thirty-seven billion dollars. This figure was more than more than the total cost of fighting World War One, and about five times larger than any New Deal annual budget. Congress also passed a conscription law, approved September sixth, nineteen forty. Under this measure, America's first peacetime draft, provision was made for training each year 1.2 million troops and 800,000 reserves. The act was later adapted to the requirements of a global war. The Latin American bulwark likewise needed bracing. The Netherlands, Denmark, and France, all crushed under the German jackboot, had orphaned colonies in the New World. Would these fall into German hands? At the Havana Conference of 1940, the United States agreed to share with its 20 New World neighbors the responsibility of upholding the Monroe Doctrine. This ancient dictum, hitherto unilateral, had been a bludgeon brandished only in the hated Yankee fist. Now, multilateral, it was to be wielded by 21 pairs of American hands, at least in theory. Bolstering Britain with the Destroyer Deal, 1940. Before the fall of France in June 1940, Washington had generally observed a technically technical neutrality. But now, as Britain alone stood between Hitler and his dream of world domination, the wisdom of neutrality seemed increasingly questionable. Hitler launched air attacks against Britain in August 1940, preparing to an invade for an invasion scheduled for September. For months, the Battle of Britain raged in the air over the British Isles. The Royal Air Force's tenacious defense of its native islands eventually led Hitler to postpone his planned invasion indefinitely. During the precarious months of the Battle of Britain, debate intensified in the United States over what foreign policy to embrace. Radio broadcast from London brought the drama of the nightly German air raids directly into millions of American homes. Sympathy for Britain grew, but it was not yet sufficient to push the United States into war. Roosevelt faced an historic decision. Whether to hunker down in the Western Hemisphere, assume a Fortress America defensive posture, and let the rest of the world go it alone, or to bolster beleaguered Britain by all means sort of war itself. Both sides had their advocates. Supporters of aid to Britain formed propaganda groups, the most potent of which was the Committee to Defend America by Aiding the Allies. Its argument was double-barreled. To interventionists, it could appeal for direct succor to the British by such slogan as, Britain is fighting our fight. To the isolationists, it could appeal for assistance to the democracies by all methods short of war, so that the terrible conflict would be kept in faraway Europe. The isolationists, both numerous and sincere, were by no means silent. Determined to avoid American bloodshed at all costs, they organized the America First Committee and proclaimed, England will fight the last American. They contended that America should concentrate what strength it had to defend its own shores, lest a victorious Hitler, after crushing Britain, plot a trans-oceanic assault. Their basic philosophy was, the Yanks are not coming, and the most effective speechmaker was the famed aviator Colonel Charles A. Lindbergh, who, ironically, had narrowed the Atlantic in 1927. Britain was in critical need of destroyers, for German submarines were again threatening to starve it out with attacks on shipping. 
Roosevelt moved boldly when, on September 2, 1940, he agreed to transfer to Great Britain 50 old model four-funnel destroyers left over from World War I. In return, the British promised to hand over to the United States eight valuable defense base sites, stretching from Newfoundland to South America. These strategically located outposts were to remain under the Stars and Stripes for 99 years. Transferring 50 destroyers to a foreign navy was highly questionable disposal of government property, despite a strained interpretation of existing legislation. The exchange was achieved by a simple presidential agreement, without so much as a buy or leave to Congress. Applause burst from the aid to Britain advocates, many of whom had been urging such a step. But condemnation arose from America firsters and other isolationists, as well as from anti-administration Republicans. Some of them approved the transfer, but decried Roosevelt's secretive and arbitrary methods. Yet so grave was the crisis that the president was unwilling to submit the scheme to the uncertainties and delays of a full-dress debate in Congress. Shifting warships from a neutral U.S. to a belligerent Britain was, beyond question, a flagrant violation of neutral obligations, at least neutral obligations that has ex existed before Hitler's barefaced aggression rendered foolish such old-fashioned concepts of fair play. Public opinion polls demonstrated that a majority of Americans were determined, even at the risk of armed hostilities, to provide the battered British with all age short of war. FDR shatters the two-term tradition, 1940. A distracting presidential election, as fate decreed, came in the midst of this crisis. The two leading Republican aspirants were round-faced and flat-voiced Senator Robert A. Taft of Ohio, son of the ex-president and the energetic boy wonder, lawyer prosecutor Thomas E. Dewey of New York. But in one of the miracles of American political history, the Philadelphia Convention was swept off its feet by a colorful latecomer, Wendell L. Wilkie, a German-descendant son of a Hoosier, Indiana. This dynamic lawyer, tussle-headed and long-lipped and broad-faced and large-framed, had until recently been a Democrat and the head of a huge public utilities corporation. A complete novice in politics, he had rocketed from political nothingness in a few short weeks. His great appeal lay in his personality, for he was magnetic, transparently trustful, and honest in a homespun, Lincoln-esque sort of way. With the galleries in Philadelphia wildly chanting, We want Wilkie, the delegates finally accepted this political upstart as the only candidate who could possibly beat Roosevelt. The Republican platform condemned FDR's alleged dictatorship, as well as the costly and confusing zigzags of the New Deal. Wilkie, an outspoken liberal, was opposed not so much to the New Deal as to its extravagances and inefficiencies. Democratic critics branded him the rich man's Roosevelt and the simple barefoot Wall Street lawyer. While the rumor pot boiled, Roosevelt delayed to the last minute the announcement of his decision to challenge the sacred two-term tradition. Despite what he described as his personal yearning for retirement, he avowed that in so grave a crisis, he owed his experienced hand to the service of the country and humanity. The Democratic delegates in Chicago, realizing that their own, only with the champ could they defeat Wilkie, drafted him by technically unanimous vote. Better a third term than a third raider was the war cry of many Democrats. Burning with sincerity and energy, Wilkie launched out upon a whirlwind, Brian-esque campaign in which he delivered over 500 speeches. At times, his voice became a hoarse croak. The country was already badly split between interventionists and isolationists, and Wilkie might have widened the breach dangerously by a violent attack on Roosevelt's aid to Britain policies. But seeing eye-to-eye -eye with FDR on necessity of bolstering the beleaguered democracies, he refrained from assailing the president's interventionism, though objecting to his methods. In the realm of foreign affairs, there was not much to choose between the two candidates. Both promised to stay out of the war, both promised to strengthen the nation's defenses, yet Wilkie, with a mop of black hair in his eyes, hit hard at Roosevelt's dictatorship and the third term. His enthusiastic followers cried, win with Wilkie, no fourth term either, and there's no indispensable man. Roosevelt, busy at his desk with mounting problems, made only a few speeches. Stung by taunts that he was leading the nation back by the back door into the European slaughterhouse, he repeatedly denied any such intention. His most specific statement was at Boston, where he emphatically declared, Your boys are not going to be sent into any foreign wars, a pledge that later came back to plague him. He and his supporters vigorously defended the New Deal, as well as all-out prepar preparations for the defense of America and aid to the Allies. Roosevelt triumphed, although Wilkie ran a strong race. The popular total was 27,307,819 to 22,321,018. And the electoral count was 449 to 82. This contest was much less a walk away than uh, in 1932 or 1936. Democratic majorities in Congress remained about the same. 
jubilant Democrats hailed their triumph as a mandate to abolish the two-term tradition. But the truth is that Roosevelt won in spite of the third-term handicap. Voters generally felt that, should war come, the experienced hand of the tried leader was needed at the helm. Less appealing was the completely inexperienced hand of the well-intentioned Wilkie, who had never held public office. The time-honored argument that one should not change horses in the middle of a stream was a strong, especially in an era of war-pumped prosperity. Roosevelt might not have won if there had not been a war crisis. On the other hand, he probably would not have run if foreign perils had not loomed so ominously. In a sense, his opponent was Adolf Hitler, not Wilkie. Congress passes the landmark Lend-Lease Act. By late 1940, embattled Britain was nearing the end of its financial tether. Its credits in America were being rapidly consumed by insatiable war orders. But Roosevelt, who had bitter memories of the wrangling over the Allied debts of World War I, was determined, as he put it, to eliminate the silly, foolish old dollar sign. He finally hit on the scheme of lending or leasing American arms to the reeling democracies. When the shooting was over, to use his comparison, the guns and tanks could be returned, just as one's next-door neighbor would return a garden hose when a threatening fire was put out. But isolationist Senator Taft, who was reputed to have the finest mind in Washington until he made it up, retorted that lending arms was like lending chewy gum. You don't want it back. Who wants a chewed-up tank? The Lend-Lease Bill, patriotically numbered 1776, was entitled An Act Further to Promote the Defense of the United States. Sprung on the country after the election was safely over, it was praised by the administration as a device that would keep the nation out of war rather than drag it in. The underlying concept was, send guns, not sons, or billions, not bodies. America, so President Roosevelt promised, would be the arsenal of democracy. It would send a limitless supply of arms to the victims of aggression, who in turn would finish the job and keep the war on their side of the Atlantic. Accounts would be settled by returning the used weapons, or their equivalents, to the United States when the war was ended. Lend-Lease was heatly debated throughout the country and in Congress. Most of the opposition came, as might be expected, from isolationists and anti-Roosevelt Republicans. The scheme was assailed as the blank check bill, and in the words of isolationist Senator Burton Wheeler, as the new AAA, Agricultural Adjustment Act bill, a measure designed to plow under every fourth American boy. Nevertheless, Lend-Lease was finally approved in March 1941 by sweeping majorities in both houses of Congress. Lend-Lease was one of the most momentous laws ever passed by Congress. It was a challenge hurled squarely into the teeth of the Axis dictators. America pledged itself to the extent of its vast resources to bolster these nations that were indirectly defending it by fighting aggression. When the gigantic operation ended in 1945, America had sent about $50 billion worth of arms and equipment, much more than the cost to the country of World War I, to those nations fighting the aggressors. The passing of Lend-Lease was in effect an economic declaration of war. Now a shooting declaration could not be very far around the corner. By its very nature, the Lend-Lease bill marked the abandonment of any pretense of neutrality. It was no destroyer deal arranged privately by President Roosevelt. The bill was universally debated over drugstore counters and cracker barrels from California all the way to Maine, and the sovereign citizen at last spoke through convincing majorities in Congress. Most people probably realized that they were tossing the old concept of neutrality out the window. But they also recognized that they would play a suicidal game if they bound themselves by the ox cart rules of the 19th century, especially while the Axis aggressors themselves openly spurned international obligations. Lend-Lease would admittedly involve a grave risk of war, but most Americans were prepared to take that chance rather than see Britain collapse and then face the diabolical dictators alone. Lend-Lease had the somewhat incidental result of gearing U.S. factories for all-out war production. The enormously increased capacity thus achieved helped save America's own skin when, at long last, the shooting war burst around its head. Hitler evidently recognized Lend-Lease as an unofficial declaration of war. Until then, Germany had avoided attacking U.S. ships. Memory of America's decisive intervention in 1917-1918 were still fresh in German minds. But after the passing of Lend-Lease, there was less point in trying to curry favor with the United States. On May 21, 1941, the Robin Moore, an unarmed American merchantman, was tor torpedoed and destroyed by a German submarine in the South Atlantic, outside a war zone. The sinkings had started, but on a limited scale. Hitler's assault on the Soviet Union spawns the Atlantic Charter. Two globe-shaking events marked the course of World War II before the assault on Pearl Harbor in December 1941. 
One was the fall of France in June 1940, the other was Hitler's invasion of the Soviet Union, almost exactly one year later, in June 1941. The scheming dictators Hitler and Stalin had been an uneasy yoke fellows under the ill-begotten Nazi-Soviet Pact of 1939. As masters of the double cross, neither trusted each other. They engaged in prolonged dickering in a secret attempt to divide potential territorial spoils between them, but Stalin balked at dominant German controls of the Balkans. Hitler thereupon decided to crush his co-conspirator, seize the oil and other resources of the Soviet Union, and then have two free hands to snuff out Britain. He assumed that his invincible armies would subdue Stalin's Mongol half-wits in a few short weeks. Out of a clear blue sky, on June, 19, June 22, 1941, Hitler launched a devastating attack on his Soviet neighbors. This timely assault was an incredible stroke of good fortune for the democratic world, or so it seemed at the time. The two fiends could now slit each other's throats on the icy steppes of Russia, or they would if the Soviets did not quickly collapse as military experts predicted. Sound American strategy seemed to dictate speedy aid to Moscow while it was still afloat. Roosevelt immediately promised assistance and backed up his words by making some military supplies available. Several months later, interpreting the Lend-Lease Law to mean that the defense of the USSR was now essential for the defense of the United States, he extended $1 billion in Lend-Lease, the first installment, on an ultimate total of $11 billion. Meanwhile, the valor of the Red Army, combined with the white paralysis of an early Russian winter, had halted Hitler's invaders at the gates of Moscow. While the surrender of the Soviet Union still a dread possibility, the drama-charged Atlantic Conference was held in August of 1941. British Prime Minister Winston Churchill, with cigar embedded in his cherubic face, secretly met with Roosevelt on a warship off the foggy coast of Newfoundland. This was the first of a series of history-making conferences between the two statesmen for the discussion of common problems, including the menace of Japan in the Far East. The most memorable offspring of this get-together was the Eight-Point Atlantic Charter. It was formally accepted by Roosevelt and Churchill and endorsed by the Soviet Union later that year. Suggestive of Wilson's 14 points, the new covenant outlined the aspirations of the democracies for a better world at war's end. Surprisingly, the Atlantic Charter was rather specific. While opposing imperialistic annexations, it promised that there would be no territorial changes contrary to the wishes of the inhabitants, self-determination. It further affirmed the right of a people to choose their own form of government and, in particular, to regain the governments abolished by the dictators. Among various other goals, the Charter declared for disarmament and a peace of security, pending a permanent system of general security, a new League of Nations. Liberals the world over took heart from the Atlantic Charter as they had taken heart from Wilson's comparable 14 points. It was especially gratifying to subject, subject populations like the Poles who were then ground under the iron heel of a conqueror. But the agreement was roundly condemned in the United States by isolationists and other hostiles to Roosevelt. What right, they charged, had neutral America to confer with belligerent Britain on common policies? Such critics missed the point. The nation was, in fact, no longer neutral. U.S. destroyers and Hitler's U-boats clash. lend lease shipments of arms to Britain on British ships were bound to be sunk by German Wolfpack submarines. If the intent was to get the munitions to England, not to dump them in the ocean, the freighters would have to be escorted by U.S. warships. Britain simply did not have enough destroyers. The dangerous possibility of being convoyed into war had been mentioned in Congress during the lengthy, lengthy debate on the Lend-Lease, but administrative spokespeople had brushed the idea aside. Their strategy was to make only one commitment at a time. Roosevelt made the fateful decision to convoy in July 1941. By virtue of his authority as commander-in-chief of the armed forces, the president issued orders for the Navy to escort Lend-Lease shipments as far as Iceland. The British would then shepherd them the rest of the way. Inevitable clashes with submarines ensued on the Iceland run, even though Hitler's orders were to strike at American warships only in self-defense. In September 1941, the U.S. destroyer Greer, provocatively trailing a German U-boat, was attacked by the undersea craft without damage to either side. Roosevelt then proclaimed a shoot-on-sight policy. <clears throat> on October 17th, the escorting destroyer Kearney, while engaged in a battle with U-boats, lost 11 men when it was crippled but not sent to the bottom. Two weeks later, the destroyer Reuben James was torpedoed and sunk off southwestern Iceland with the loss of more than 100 officers and enlisted men. Neutrality was still inscribed on the statute books, but not in American hearts. Congress, responding to public pressures and confronted with a shooting war, voted in mid-November 1941 to pull the teeth from the now useless Neutrality Act of 1939. Merchant ships could henceforth be legally armed, and they could enter the combat zones with munitions for Britain. 
Americans braced themselves for wholesale attacks by Hitler's submarines. Surprise attack on Pearl Harbor. The blow-up came not in the Atlantic, but in the faraway Pacific. This explosion should have surprised no close, close observer for Japan, since September 1940 had been a formal military ally of Nazi Germany, America's shooting foe in the North Atlantic. Japan's position in the Far East had grown more perilous by the hour. It was still mired down in the costly and exhausting China incident, from which it could extract neither honor nor victory. Its war machine was fatally dependent on immense shipments of steel, scrap iron, oil, and aviation gas 